you should make your way to your seats. You should start making your way to your seats. We will start in five minutes. We will start back up in five minutes. Everyone should be in their seats now. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Chief. All right, so how's everybody doing? If there's anybody that's talking to you that's not in their seat, just walk away from them. Just walk away from them. Because I know Miss Brantley is in her seat. I believe I see her in her seat because I know she's a fine example of how we should start on time. <laughs> As I told you this morning, we've, uh, I believe, outlined a phenomenal program for you, strategy experience. So at this time, to continue uh, with our morning festivities, I'm going to introduce and ask to come forward Brigadier General Gorham, who is the Vice Chair of the Joint Diversity Executive Council from the great state of North Carolina. Let's give him a big hand. Good morning, everyone. 
Our keynote speaker today is Chris Denham. In 1984, Chris completed his MBA at the Institute of Management Technology and migrated to the United States along with his bride, Anila. Winning a sales contest in 1990 earned him a ticket to a seminar conducted by the legendary motivator, Zig Ziglar. This chance encounter would be the catalyst that shaped the life of Chris for the next two decades, for Chris joined the Ziegler Corporation in 1991 as a telemarketer and eventually became their vice president of global, global operation. Through training, teaching, and facilitating seminars all over the world, Chris launched his professional speaking career as one of the only two executive coaches personally trained by Zig Ziglar, Chris has successfully delivered his message of hope, humor, and balance over 50 countries throughout the continental United States. As a circular designer, he has authored programs on staff development, sales, leadership, personal development, and communication. His clients this is the who's who of global enterprise, and he has received accolades from some of the most distinguished organizations, including the United States Army. Hoo! Oh, that's a weak hoo. Hoo! That's what I'm talking about. Christian Dior, Steelcase Industries, Apollo Hospitals, EDS, Texas Instruments, PepsiCo and Energizer Batteries. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Mr. Chris Durnham. Well, thank you for that warm welcome, which I so richly deserve, <laughs> but so seldom get. How many of you have figured out through perceptive intuition that I'm not a native of Texas? Okay, we got a semi-alert group here today. Owing to the fact that I'm originally from a different country, and owing to the fact that we may have some communication problems, I want to set the parameters right. Just raise your right hand for me like this. This is America's universal symbol for fantastic or absolutely nothing. Go ahead, just raise your right hand. Now bring it down slowly and put it on your chin. For those of you who missed, the chin is this pointed thing at the end of the face, and I know I have my work cut out for me. What you did was react to that which you saw instead of respond to that which you believe. But before I take off on my narrative of hope and optimism, try to follow the guidelines of this pursuit of greatness that you have set as a benchmark for your conference. With all humility as an immigrant who benefited from this great land, I want to take a moment See, lying on a nondescript beach in a remote southern Indian town, looking at the heavens above, wondering if a utopia named America, an opportunity called free enterprise, could exist for someone like me, I have to pay homage to the men and women of the armed forces of the United States who do what you do selflessly, courageously, gallantly, and nobly, so people like me can dream. I know you salute all day long, but allow me to salute you. If I came to America with $9 in my pocket in 1986 and people ask me how poor we were, we were so poor we go to Kentucky Fried Chicken lick other people's fingers. <laughs> there, there's poor and there's po. We was po. We didn't have tracks to be on the other side off. Now we had running water, if you needed it, you ran and got it, and that's not reasonably far from the truth. But when I landed in the United States in 1986, I began to cling on to some dreams of hope and optimism. This whole narrative of diversity that General McKinley put in his leader's guide by using another word called similarity is what sparked my interest. I began to create a purpose and a passion that was wielded in two identities. One was the belief that I am proud of where I came from. 
See, every one of us is responsible for our, is accountable for our future, but we are only responsible for our heritage to a part because our past brought us to where we are. But it is the tomorrows of our life that matter. Within the confines of leadership, something I realized very early on, regardless of who I was and how I looked and felt, and it was this. If you're irreplaceable, you're unpromotable. If nobody else can do what you do, you're going to be doing it a long time, is how we say it in the South. See, there are a couple of common things that I want to set the establishment on, and these are the two narratives. First is, how does a black cow eat green grass Give white milk, yellow butter, red meat, and brown leather. I don't know, it just does. I can't explain that. It's one of the existential questions. The other question I can't explain is why does Keanu Reeves have a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame <laughs> when that's reserved for actors? I can't answer that one either. I don't understand some of the commonplace things that happen in our world that give us these enigmas. Why do drive through ATMs have their keypad in Braille? I don't know. Why do hearing clinics advertise on the radio? I have no clue. <laughs> but there are some things I know about gratitude and hope, some things I know about optimism and life, and that is what today is about. As I am being asked and entrusted with the mantle of setting the stage for something that you will embark on, in terms of learning, depending on the track you take, whether you're at the intermediate, whether you're advanced, regardless of all of the information that you will be inundated with, I want you to begin with a clean slate. See, most people wake up in the morning, stand in front of the mirror and say, mirror, mirror on the wall, do I have a prayer at all? <laughs> if the mirror ever looked back at you and said, with that kind of hairdo, go back to bed, listen to the mirror. <laughs> if you walk out in this world looking like the picture on your driver's license or like you've been weaned on a pickle, ain't nobody going to treat you like a glamour shot. <laughs> You're happy, tell your face. You know the type, some people would brighten up a whole room by leaving. Don't be that kind of person. <laughs> by the same token, some people are so narrow-minded, they look through a keyhole with both eyes. You know the type. <laughs> and as the old saying goes, a narrow mind and a fat head usually come on the same body. <laughs> so today, take a step back, stand in front of that mirror and say, mirror, mirror on the wall, here I am, what's Eric Hoffer said, in times of change, it is the learners who will inherit the earth, while the learned will find themselves beautifully equipped for a world that no longer exists. World War I hero T. Lawrence went back to England and wrote a book called The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Some of you old-timers recognize the name. On his life was made the epic Lawrence of Arabia. Peter O'Toole acted in the movie. If you ever have 84 hours to watch a movie, watch this one. <laughs> the movie is slightly longer than World War I. But T. E. Lawrence said this, all men dream, but not equally. Those that dream in the dark, dusky recesses of their mind wake by day to find that it was but vanity, false pride. But those that dream with their eyes open, pay attention to them, for they will change the world. Within the confines of the National Guard's diversity council and this new mandate that you have to change the very face because of the demographics that warrant it, because of the policies that require it, because of the mission that is impacted by it, because of the safety in the environment that is created, you and I have what they call that rendezvous with destiny. In the confines of leadership today, we have that privilege to make a difference. Emerson said, if you're going to pull me up, you better be on higher ground. Coach Joby Harris said, otherwise the day will come when by the sheer weight of our numbers, we will drag you down. Mediocrity and misery do love company. It's been said that every third person in this world is either amazingly beautiful and unusually bright, incredibly handsome and unfailingly brilliant, good look at the person on your left. Go ahead. <laughs> now take a good look at the person on your right. Like me, you're probably convinced it ain't either one of them. <laughs> From this moment forward, think of yourself as that third person. You were designed for accomplishment, engineered for success, and endowed with the seeds of greatness. One of the great orators of yesteryear, who was a senator and a congressman, state and some thought would be president oh, 150 years ago was Daniel Webster. He said, if we and our posterity reject religious instruction and authority, violate the principles of eternal ethics, trifle on moral injunction, and recklessly destroy the political constitution that upholds us, no man can say how sudden the catastrophe that will overwhelm us and bury all our glory in profound obscurity. 
We are looking at an organization that began its earliest reaches in the mid-1600s that has shaped the very landscape of this republic. You and I, my friends, part of that 300 million that call this great and glorious land home have an object to fulfill, a passion to pursue, but there is always a person to prepare and maybe, yes, a price to pay. Let me paint for you four motifs. The first is a foundation. Every one of us look for that mountaintop experience, but the food that grows on the mountaintop, nothing grows on the mountaintop. The food you eat on the mountaintop only grows in the valley. So today, perceive yourself to be in that valley of learning, of information. Assimilate into your mind the good, the clean, the pure, the powerful, and the positive, and the frame will begin to change. Here are some questions we need to ask at the foundation level. But before we go down the questions, I'm reminded of the fact that most of us wake up every day with questions. And for example, these two guys wanted to play the question game. One friend turned to the other and said, before we begin our day, I want to start by playing the question game. The second friend said, how do you play the question game? He said, oh, it's easy. I'll ask myself a question, and then I'll answer it. If I answer it right, you buy me a Coke. <laughs> the guy said, that's ridiculous. You ask yourself a question, and you answer it, and I buy you a Coke. He says, yes, yeah, go. You ask yourself a question, and then you try to answer it. If you get it right, I'll buy you a Coke. So how does it go? He says, I'll go first. My question to myself is, how does a rabbit dig a hole without getting any dirt on the outside? My answer to myself is, I think it digs it from the inside. The second friend said, how does it do that? He said, I don't know, that's your question. <laughs> it's okay to have questions. In fact, I honestly believe, as Colonel Barry said earlier, that we need to have a fire lit beneath us. And we need to ask ourselves the pressing questions of our times. And the conversation we have with ourselves should be, is this, will this, could this, should this be the best conference I've ever attended? Because here's the truth. You are not giving the environment and your colleagues two days of your time. You're giving them two days of your life. Gone forever, kaput, never to be replaced. So what are the questions we ask? First question I ask every morning, who am I? See, my business card could say intergalactic director of product procurement for the East Coast for exclusive distribution. No, I'm a salesman. <laughs> you make up all kinds of stuff on your business card. In fact, when people say, Chris, tell me a little bit about yourself, I tell them, I'm Anila's husband and Nick's dad. That was a blessing. Everything else was a choice. Mary Crowley said, you are free up until the moment of choice. Then the choice controls the chooser. First question we ask ourselves as we begin this initiative of making an impact, creating the ripples that would unleash that tidal wave, who are you? Second question, where do you come from? See, we live in a very fickle society in the Western Hemisphere. We borrow money. We don't have to buy things. We don't need to impress people. We don't like to become someone we can't recognize. I'll always be the little kid from the rural part of southern India who had a dream. And today on Twitter, Colonel Berry's quote was there. He said, if, you're, if, 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 you're, if your problems, I mean, your life is a problem if, if, if your dreams are not big enough. And I'm paraphrasing him. If your dreams are not big enough, if you're looking at your life through memories and not dreams, then your life is, is, is just out of kilter. Always look back to where you came from and begin to create that analysis. And when you create that analysis, life will become. See, life is tough. But if you're tough on yourself, life becomes infinitely easier on you. I remember one day I was practicing in the guest room. When I first tried to communicate, people said, you want to be a speaker? Yeah, you're from India. What gave it away, Sherlock? No, what I'm meaning to say is people from India don't become speakers. I understand most are doctors, those that can't are engineers, those that can't make it, buy a motel. I get it. <laughs> I couldn't tell a joke to save my life. I couldn't tell a story to save a speech. But I had to be proud of my heritage, and that was a non-negotiable. I was not going to abandon where I came from. Earlier, the great stress specialist said, gratitude is the healthiest of all human emotions, anger the most destructive. 
We cannot be something we're not. We can only be the best you. I was practicing in the guest room, and my son walks in all of seven. He looks at me, he says, Papa, why do you keep practicing so much? I said, son, I always practice. It's what professionals do. He says, well, I didn't know you practiced when it was for church. I said, why? He said, church is free. See, he's a little capitalistic kid born in Denton County, Texas. He doesn't get it. I was able to give him this nugget, son, the day you practice for something you're not paid to do is the beginning of the journey that will take you to the place where they pay you for what you've practiced. One day you'll arrive at that pinnacle of glory. One day you'll be at that mountaintop. But you have to answer those two questions. Who are you and where do you come from? Question three, whom do you credit with the platform upon which you will build a monument to your legacy? And in fact, in that leader's guide, I liked that word legacy the general McKinley put in there. What will you credit? Who will you credit for the platform upon which you will build a monument to your legacy? See, the reason we are afraid of legacies is we are afraid of criticism. See, most of us want to leave an inheritance because we didn't have enough, our parents didn't give us enough. We want to leave more for our children. Inheritance is noble. Problem with an inheritance, those that get it, glad you're dead. <laughs> At least a legacy, you can enjoy its building. So whom do you credit? But we are afraid of the critics. And critics got nothing on anybody. Think about it this way. Benjamin Franklin put it best when he said, democracy is two wolves and a lamb arguing on what to have for lunch. <laughs> Liberty is a well-armed lamb contesting that vote. <laughs> to which I, your humble immigrant correspondent, would like to add, tyranny is a bunch of rats trying to the wolves and the lambs feel guilty. I tell people, if you don't want to be a wolf, be a lamb. But quit listening to the rats. They got nothing on anybody. <laughs> and the rats are all the critics. I was speaking in San Francisco, California at the Cow Palace. <laughs> well, appropriate for an Indian, I guess. But <clears throat> <clears throat> and when I was speaking, a critic took a pot shot at me. He said one of the speakers was a husky Indian in a finely tailored suit. He had patriotic zeal to him, looked like a pseudo disciple of Zig Ziglar, but for whatever reason, left to a favorable ovation. Now, the freedom of speech that gave him the right to write that ridiculous piece is the same one gave me the right to write this rebuttal. I wrote him a reply. I said, dear sir, as a writer, I marveled at your ability to phrase words in such a poetic fashion. But I took exception to three parts of your narrative, and I highlight them for your review. First, you said, you called me a pseudo disciple of Zig Ziglar, and I looked up my 1828 Noah Webster dictionary, which Mr. Z gave me. Incidentally, you know why Webster wrote the dictionary? Every day his wife kept saying, what does that mean? So at the end of it, he had a dictionary. <laughs> <clears throat> Ironically, in the 1828 Webster dictionary, the word optimism is listed, the word pessimism isn't. Fact. When I looked up the 1828 Webster Dictionary, the word disciple is a constant student, like in Disciple of Plato, Mr. Z. Second, you said I had some kind of patriotic zeal. Sir, I challenge you to any speech from Patrick Henry down to Martin Luther King. You take a day to prepare, I'll take a day to prepare. When you speak, they may stand and clap. When I speak, they'll stand and march. Don't doubt my patriotism. Third, I sent your article to my parents in India who don't know what a critic is. They were just glad their little boy's name was mentioned in the same article as General Colin Powell, Rudy Giuliani, Joe Montana, and the like. <laughs> By the way, sir, I've traveled much of the free world and I've not seen a statue erected to a critic. So I'm under the humble opinion that you're not held in such high esteem after all. <laughs> One word reply, touche. See, when your foundation has those unshakable questions of who you are, where do you come from, and whom do you credit, you can answer the Lex 3. What makes you laugh? See, for me, ignorance is laugh. And I see it in such broad supply in this, the most liberated of all nations. It's like people can't wait to get a hold of my itinerary, run to the airport, stand in front of me, and open a big can of stupid. <laughs> the other day, I'm standing in an airport in Dallas, waiting for the flight, and there's a celebrity in front of me. She'd already arrived. Post 9-11 world, she doesn't want to produce her ID. So she's telling the flight attendant, don't you know who I am? No, I don't. Produce your ID. Duh, 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 duh. Goes back and forth. I tap the celebrity on the shoulder. These are what I call Dunham intervention moments. <laughs> I said, ma'am, all of us celebrities have to show our ID. 
She said, who are you? I said, Gandhi. <laughs> if someone has to tell you who you are, you ain't. <laughs> By the way, there's some new scientific evidence that if you have a tendency to laugh and you suppress the laughter, it'll revert back inside and spread your hips. Let it out. <laughs> No, I'm not saying just walk around grinning from ear to ear like you've eaten a banana sideways. That's insanity. But at least have a little pep in your step, a little bounce to your rounds. Ask yourself, what gives you the gaiety? What gives you the mirth? What gives you the desire? See, happiness depends on happenings. But joy is undiluted. It's unadulterated. And it's pure. Other people can give you pleasure. But you will never find true joy until you learn to help someone else. Other people can give you pleasure. But you will never find true joy until you learn to help someone else. What makes you laugh? Question number five is difficult. What makes you grieve? We have lost wonder because we have lost innocence. We of all species are the most emotional, walking around pretending to be the most logical. In a world that has now become increasingly politically correct, you and I walk on eggshells because we don't understand the trueness of what loss of innocence will do. When you lose innocence and wonder, my son, teenager, when I communicate with him, it's like, where are you going? Nowhere. What are you doing? Nothing. Who are you going with? No one. When are you coming back? Don't know. Can I borrow 20 bucks? Let me get this straight. What kind of a capitalistic time warp do you live in, child? that you can go nowhere with no one to do nothing and not know when you're coming back, yet I get to finance it. <laughs> See, but his heart has been jaded and callous because this dude can do his homework with his nose, listen to music, text with his toes, and when the atrocity of a Virginia Tech takes place on his big screen TV in his living room, his little heart doesn't even flinch because that is now normal. We have lost innocence as a species because we have gone down this path of logic instead of staying on emotion, which is the healthiest. Let me explain this in a different way. Many of you have flown, as have I. I've done roughly four million miles. Every time I get up into the air, the flight attendant comes on and in her beautiful voice will say, ladies and gentlemen, the captain told me to tell you, which means I'm not even in charge, but I'm going to tell you to buckle up. And click, 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 whether you're in a seven-seater or a 747, everybody buckles up. Now, on the ground, it's the law. But three and five, National Safety Board has said, if you're buckled up on the ground, you'll live. But people don't wear their seatbelt on the ground because they're just going to the store. Now, folks, I don't know what you consider logical. I don't care how well you buckled up there. <laughs> if something happens to that sucker, you're going to die. And people walk around telling me we are like, no, we are emotional people pretending to be logical and missing out on the innocence that comes with the de having that wonder. Unless we recapture the wonder. Ravi Zacharias wrote a book called Recapture the Wonder. When you recapture the wonder, you'll realize one amazing statistic. Seven billion people will walk this planet during your lifetime. Within all of God's ordained creation, there is not another just like you. You're unique in every attribute. Seven billion, and you're one of a kind. That should recapture the wonder. Now, there's only one time where everybody's going to say nice things about you. Might as well get this out of the way. You're flat off your back, looking up. <laughs> Pastor looking down, you're the man. <laughs> right now, you're the dead man, but you're the man. At that point in your life, you can make one of only two statements. I wish I had, or I'm glad I did. See, I wish I had is one of regret. My mentor and hero, Zig Ziglar, will turn 86 in November. A mind that is slowly eaten away with different kinds of debilitating illnesses, and they say Alzheimer's may be one of them. 50 years, he liberated the hearts and minds of a planet. And the one thing that allowed him to liberate that world is the same thing that is now being dropped. I went to have lunch with him. He's my hero. Out of the fog of this mind loss, he leans forward and says, you know, I have no regrets. 
and he goes back into the fog. Can you imagine? The world has robbed you of that which you made a living with. The only words on your lips are, I have no regrets. That's the way to go. That's the way to go. But question number six is, what gives you hope? Alfred Adler, the great psychologist, said, hope is the foundational quality of all change. John Maxwell said, if there's hope in the future, there's power in the present. So when you look at the foundation of what you're called to do in the next day, two days in terms of the information you amass, and then you go back to disseminate it to the people who depend on you, who rely on you, to your respective commands, these are the six questions that form the foundation. Who am I? Where do I come from? Whom do I credit with what I've become? What makes me laugh? What makes me cry? And what gives me hope? Once you have that foundation intact, we can begin to paint a definition, which is our next motif. In definition, we have two ideas. One is pride, and the other is balance. Now, folks, I must admit to you, as an attendant father, I've traveled most of my boy's life. When my boy was three, I hit the road. For those of you who work hard at what you do, you know what I'm going to talk about next. This quality time versus quantity time that somehow suppresses us. The pride I'm talking about is a healthy self-pride. See, this year my boy will go to college. By God's grace, he's gotten a full scholarship to go study mechanical engineering, proving once and for all that genetics can skip a generation. <laughs> I graduated in that half of the class that usually makes the top half possible. There's no way I can have a genius kid. <laughs> But for his college essay, my boy wrote, the man who has made the greatest impact in my life is my father. How could that be? I'm an absentee father. Never been there. I travel. I do 140 events a year. I log roughly 160,000 miles, 55 countries, six continents. You name it, I've done it. But in his essay, he wrote, because of his unshakable faith in God and his undeniable love for my mother, I know. I will never have to make a choice that will be dishonorable. See, what are your ambitions and what gives you that pride? We are, we are moving at the speed of information. Are we willing to adapt at the speed of feedback? More importantly, no longer will our grandfather's thesis work in an app world. Even within the confines of diversity, a lot is changing. And it's changing at the speed of information. People are becoming savvy. We are in a flat world. No longer can we wait five years for a policy and a procedure to come down the pike and take effect. It has to work on Monday, and by Thursday, someone's asking for a feedback. You're going to ask for feedback on this conference, as I heard last night, in seven days. What has happened? We have compressed our time frames, but the pride and balance are vital. They're 24 hours in a day. For eight to 10 hours of the day, you practice the skill that allows you to make a living. But for the balance of the time, you have to invest in the will that allows you to shape a life. When skill and will come together for the very first time, you will have unleashed a 24-hour champion. Now, I'm talking a little bit about relationships, and I know it gets dicey. First thing I would encourage you to stop doing is stop listening to country western music. <laughs> I know that doesn't go over very well. But here are some of the lyrics. My wife ran away with my best friend, and I sure do miss him. <laughs> You're the reason things are ugly. Or if I had shot her then, I'd be out by now. These things communicate. <laughs> Every day, listen to information that is good, clean, pure, powerful, and positive. Communicate with the families, they matter, because they will teach you how to be selfless and how not to have a bias. Until we perfect that inner circle, nothing you do on the external matters. We have to be giving at our family unit level for us to allow the remaining skills and the will and the tools and the mind and the heart to begin to take shape. The other day, I asked my bride, I said, sweetheart, if I were to die, would you bury me or cremate me? She said, I'll have you stuffed and mounted next to the TV. <laughs> that way, during football season, when I talk to you, it'll be like you never left. <laughs> Someone said, well, that's all fine. How often should I tell my wife I love her? Because everything is programmed. Give me a seven steps, a three points, a button. 
How often should I tell my wife I love her? I said, before somebody else does. <laughs> it's not complicated. Marriage is grand, divorce is a hundred grand. <laughs> but when I'm talking about pride and balance, I'm talking about the totality of understanding who you are culturally, socially, psychologically, physiologically, psychologically, and yes, if you so do believe, zoologically. Take a step back. See, every night, wherever I am in the world, I say the same thing to my son. Whether I'm in Bangor, Maine, Bangalore, India, Augusta, Georgia, Auckland, New Zealand, I've said the same thing. You're mine, and I love you. You're terrific, and I'm proud of you. And he has to repeat that to me. At seven, it was easy. At eight, it became awkward. At nine, he was stubborn. At ten, defiant. It started with, Papa, you're mine, and I love you. You're terrific, and I'm proud of you. But at ten, it became Dad. At 12, it became father. But when he says that affirmation, regardless, he always interjects papa. See, this is what, when we talk about heart set, remember one of the four principles was heart? A message will travel around the world in two seconds and then take an entire lifetime to go the last six inches between the head and the heart. Pride. Personal recognition instills in me a desire for excellence. Pride, P-R-I-D, personal recognition instills in me a desire for excellence. And then balance. Now don't hear the balance from the wrong thing. Relativism is a crock. Some things are right, some things are wrong. Everything's not relative. People who say it's all relative means they have lousy relatives. <laughs> As the old saying goes, you put one foot in boiling hot water, the other foot in ice cold water, on average you're miserable. We have to pick a side. My wife has never said, now sweetheart, tell me the truth. On all these trips you take, have you been relatively faithful? <laughs> It'll come to you, don't worry. <laughs> there is a break, you can laugh later. <laughs> See, pride and balance are, are important as you redefine yourself in your leadership roles. John Maxwell said, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. While it's a privilege to be asked to lead, while it is an honor to get to lead, while it is our duty to do it well, ultimately the umbrella of leadership is what? Influence. Because directly or indirectly, you are impacting at least 10,000 people during your lifetimes. The lights are always on, the camera is always rolling. Most of the falls of the last 100 years were character falls. People who wanted to do the right thing said the wrong thing at the wrong time, and they thought no one was looking. And that's when they got busted. But how do you get pure of spirit? It is in this definition stage. My papa used to tell me, he studied under a streetlight to graduate from college. Mama was a child bride, married to him at 13, brother at 14, me at 17. Be it a job, big or small, do it well or not at all. Your word is your bond. If your word's no good, you're no good. Now, why should I listen to my father? 1955, he finished his undergraduate degree and had to go work to support a family. Six, seven years later, two of his sisters were widowed 10 days apart. India has no social security, no welfare provision. Between them, they had nine children. If dad hadn't stepped down to pick them up, they would have perished. Dad continued on his obligations. Another brother committed suicide, another widow, another child. He continued on his obligations. But at the age of 75, daddy went back to the university. 55 years after he had finished his undergraduate and enrolled for his master's. And here was his comment. When my obligations finish, my dreams begin. Obligations finish, my dreams begin at the age of 77. Daddy graduated from the university with his master's in philosophy and logic, graduating in the first division in the top 10 in his class. So great was his accomplishment that at the age of 71, mom went back to get her master's. I called her day before yesterday. I said, what are you doing, mama? She said, I'm finishing my homework. He's gone on his morning walk. If I don't finish my assignment by the time he comes back, I'm angry. My father is convincing my mother to do her homework because he doesn't want her to just be a student. He wants her to excel. Pride and balance. 
redefine. Now, most of you are thinking, man, what a group of slow learners. <laughs> Next, number three is expansion. Foundation, definition, expansion. Raise your right hand for me as high as go. Now, raise it just a little bit higher. Why didn't you do that to begin with? I said as high as it'll go. <laughs> See, we all save a little bit for a rainy day that never comes. Remember when we heard earlier, total commitment, engagement, let something light yourself on fire. In fact, better yet, Cabot Robert used to say, if you're incapable of doing anything, set yourself on fire. At least other people will come to watch you burn. <laughs> Expansion requires us. John F. Kennedy said, goals are nothing more than dreams with feet. But what kind of goals are we setting? Part of your mentoring, if you look at your leader's guide, in the mentoring, the G stands for goal setting. Setting some goals. The vision of setting that goal. Well, in 1960, when John F. Kennedy was running for president, or when he became president, he says, we want to be the first. Let us be the first by the end of this decade to put a man on the moon. And in 1969, from Ohio, set foot on the moon. Russia abandoned its quest for lunar supremacy. Not a bayonet was yielded, not a bullet was fired. America had achieved that victory. Later on, when the engineers at NASA were asked, they said it was because one man had a dream. We had the courage to follow. What are your goals? See, first thing we need to do is identify what we want to do at our level. So much information will be given to you. How do you disseminate it to make sure that you're doing it in bite-sized pieces? If you take all the books and the manuals you've been given and try to go impact your region, you'll be walking around like a lunatic, totally confused. You need to take a step back and say, I want five things that are going to be the non-negotiable in the next six months. Then I'll add another skill set, I'll add another will set. Bite size, piece at a time. First, identify your goal. But again, we live in the Western Hemisphere. January 1, what is the number one goal America sets? Wait, husband says you got to lose weight. Wife says you got to lose the weight. Doctor says you got to lose the weight. Finally, the poor sap says I'll do it. For 13 days, we'll steam everything. Broccoli, dashboard, cardboard, headboard. We'll eat every god-awful thing. Day number 14, some dirty dog will roll the pastry cart by. <laughs> With considerable disdain that comes from lack of discipline, we'll eat one lousy donut. While the powdered sugar is still fresh on your upper lip, someone else will say, two for one, chicken fried steak, you want to go? It's que sera, sera, another year goes by. See, you cannot just be setting goals between conferences. Changes have to take place between conferences, so when you come to the next one, you can now build on what you have already amassed. Every step has to be a growth step. In fact, write this down somewhere if you want to. Don't just be on the go, be on the grow. Don't just sit there to get there, sit there to arrive more informed. Identify the things you want. Second, look at the benefits that will come your way. What will the guard's legacy be like? How will you as leaders entrusted to this mantle look like 15 years down the road, 20 years down the road when someone else comes and says, hey, because you had the courage of your convictions to stand your ground, I am a better person. I remember the day as if it were yesterday. I finally made it to the big leagues. I got to speak at the Georgia Dome. 35,000 in attendance. They put it between Jimmy Carter and Rudy Giuliani. Not because I'm good. They just wanted to stop a fight. <laughs> I didn't care. I was just glad I was there. And like a scared rabbit, I went out and I just did my thing. I got a standing ovation from 35,000 people. I ran to the limo and I hid behind Mr. Ziegler, scared, crying. The immigrant boy had made it. America had delivered on her promise. I said, Mr. Z, how can I ever thank you for reaching down? and picking me up. You had so many you could impact, yet you chose me, a boy from another country, from another faith, and yet you invested your time, your talent, and your treasure, and you mentored me. I'd never forget his words when he said, son, all I did was open one door, but I had taught you so well, you ran in looking for light switches. All I did was open one door, but I taught you so well, you ran in looking for light switches. See, what are the obstacles I had when I began this? Language, enunciation, pronunciation. In fact, my first start as a public speaker, I went to prison as a volunteer. 
And I remember speaking to the inmates, and the first day I didn't even have any concept of time. After an hour and a half of flapping my gums, I looked at the first first row and I said, I'm so sorry, I, I lost track of time. He said, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> Speaker's dream, my first maiden venue, captive audience. <laughs> but I remember the fourth time I got stuck in a traffic jam and I walked in late, 625. I was supposed to be there at 6. Now I'm a volunteer, they're inmates. And I walked in and I apologized. I said, guys, I'm so sorry. And the guy looked at me, same guy in the front row. He said, what's another betrayal? And that's when I realized, even to those that I volunteer with, I will never be late again. What's another betrayal? What are the obstacles that are preventing you? And we'll begin to realize, if you put them in perspective, the goals will start, you'll start understanding why some of these goals are not working. What are the benefits that come your way? Then, who are the people that can help you? The good book said a long time ago, let the weak say, I am strong. There are people in this room who have already amassed the credentials to give you a shortcut to greatness. But you have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone into the effective zone and ask them, hey, I want to make this impact. I want these five points to be part of my identity. I want these steps. Can you tell me how you did it? Can you teach me the narrative? And what happens is when we learn from each other, that's when we will truly be diverse in our understanding. What are the skills you need? If you're at point A and you want to be at point B, Always learn what's required at point B while still at point A. When you get to point B, if you get to use the information case rasra. Otherwise, Rick Warren said you've lived a purpose life. I've never met an overqualified person. They just don't exist. I met a lot of underperforming people, but never an overqualified person. What do you need? I remember when I wrote my book, The American Dream from an Indian Heart. At a seminar like this, I wrote down, I want to be an author. I think everybody needs to write a book. I, I don't think everybody needs to try and get it published. <laughs> but I remember when I wrote my book, I sent it off to the first publisher thinking, man, I'd followed the steps. Some motivational speaker sounding like a dying calf in a snowstorm motivated me, so I'm going to go out there and do it. I wrote one and one-tenth pages a day, just like they'd asked me to. At the end of the year, I had 400 pages of what I thought was brilliance. Well, the publisher sent me back my manuscript, untouched, unopened, unscathed, with just a letter. Dear sir, as an editorial board, we have come to the conclusion that not only do we recommend you stop writing, we encourage you to stop reading. We have never seen such drivel before. See, what I thought was genius about my life wasn't because it was my life. Till I had the courage of my convictions to step out of the comfort zone of my own intellect and solicit an editor who could then look at my manuscript and say, let me pull a book out of here. She did. She says, sweetheart, this is not a 400 page book. Give me permission to take away most of what you think is genius. And I can probably find a hundred and that will work. That book is now going into its third edition. It's been on the bestseller list in India for five years. And the greatest joy I have is when my dad walks through that bookstore in that little Southern Indian town and says, that's my boy. Now, in India, everybody's buying the book because they think it's a book about how to come to America. <laughs> but till I got an editor involved in my life, and comfortable, hear me carefully, folks, if you don't hear anything else I've said today, there are two kinds of people in this world that can shape you and make you. One are the constructive critics, and the other are the destructive critics. Destructive critics are people who have the same problems we do. When you have two people with the same problem, you have the word sympathy in your leader's guide, the word empathy is mentioned. Sympathy is when someone has a problem and you say, chicken lips, you think you have a problem? I'll tell you about my problem. Now we got two people with two problems singing kumbaya and no solution. Empathy is when you say, you have a problem? Here's what we have found out as a mandate. Here are some of the policies and procedures that came down from the Joint Task Commission. Here are some of the rules and regulations that if we follow, here are some of the trainings we can participate in. That is empathetic. Whenever you feel overburdened, find someone else with a bigger problem than yours and get involved in solving their problem and yours will go away. 
It's always worked through the history of time. Now that's expansion. Lastly, as we wind her up, conclusion. How do you know you finished well? How do you know your legacy mattered? How do you know that you were not just another wandering generality, but you became a meaningful specific? I had the privilege to spend a little time with General Gorham yesterday and this morning. He said something to me that I went online and did a little bit of research for some of the speeches he had made, and one that, and I asked his permission to share this, one of the speeches he made at a commencement address at the East Carolina University. He talked about his father, a sharecropper on a tobacco farm at the Falkland Farm, I think is what it was called, and a father who gave him this advice. Pay now and play later, or play now and pay later. Either way in life, you will pay and play, you decide. I had never heard it from him, but I heard it from one of his speeches that I went online. But when I saw all those words, immediately my mind started ringing because I've been saying those words because I heard John Maxwell talk about this in a lecture 15 years ago. Pay now and play later. Or play now and pay later. Either way in life, you will play and you'll pay. You decide when. See, finishing well is all about arriving at that pinnacle. The loneliest place in the world is the mountaintop without any people around you. The loneliest place is if you've achieved the very pinnacle of glory and the only people who are applauding you are the people who are at the bottom of the mountain and you're looking for someone to celebrate with, someone to share these acknowledgments with, someone to have this kudos with. See, when he went back to that school and was able to look at the kids in the eye and says, what I am seeing now would have been unthinkable when I sat where you sat. Judge Ziegler put it best, Zig's late brother. You go as far as you can see. When you get there, you can see further. You go as far as you can see. When you get there, you can see further. Ultimately, our legacies are going to be shaped how? When 9-11 happened, my life became a living hell. Now, I'm the one who they randomly pre-select for screen. It'll come to you. I love what I do. I hate that I have to do it sometimes. Today, in the name of political correctness, they profile everybody except me, which is good. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. When 9-11 happened, I remember coming to the living room. Four days after I'd had an episode on a plane, I was on my flight to Tampa. There were not many people on the planes those days. Everybody was terrified. Terror had reached our shores. The dastardly deed committed by a group of people had altered the landscape and the very heart and psyche and soul of a nation. A nation that had embraced people from every walk of life and today is the only country on planet Earth that has at least one person represented from every other principality recognized by the UN had finally succumbed to fear. And there I was. I can do renditions of Patrick Henry that will make you cry. Stood up to use the restroom and a lady managed to let out a blood-curdling scream. She says, oh my God, we are under attack. And I felt this small. Now folks, I get to sit in the front of the plane. The only, way, the only reason they don't let me fly the plane is because of the way I look, but the, I'm there. How do you deal with it? You love this nation. You love its diversity. You love its inclusiveness. You love every And I will go to India the land of my birth, and fight for America if she demanded of me. Because one day, when I needed refuge, she opened her arms. I owe it to her. But that day, helpless, hapless, hopeless. Flight attendant asked me to sit in coach in a seat that had nobody around and said, sir, for the duration of the flight, if you don't mind just sitting here, we'll deal with it when we land. And I had to answer some questions. And as soon as I they got off, they let me off. That was OK. No big deal. I walk into the house. My boy is crying, refuses to go to school. Dad, I don't want to go back to school. Why? Well, they said, damn all these foreigners, send them all home. I didn't do anything. I was born in Denton County. I was born in the Louisville Hospital. I'm American. Son, I can't change one iota of how you look. I can't change one attribute of how you sound. I can't alter your mom's identity. I can't alter my identity. I can't change our records. But from this day forward, I can do one thing. 
I will traipse the length and breadth of this country and speak about her grandeur and her valor. So someday, when you're walking the paved streets, someone will walk up to you and say, Nicholas, I am sure glad your dad came to America. He changed my life. Son, I can give you a good name. That's all I can. Can't give you anything else. I can give you a good name. And with that, my son stood up. He shrugged his shoulders and got ready to fight. We can't go back and alter anything. Dr. King said, if you don't want anybody to stand on your back, stand erect. We can't change one iota of how people talk, how they look, or how they perceive, or how they feel. All we can take ownership is, is how we are going to participate. Now, how many of you have ever been to a sporting event? How many of you are not going to raise your hand no matter what the question? <laughs> okay, just checking. Well, at a sporting event, how many times did the referee call a play that was a foul on a play on your home team and you thought they were wrong? Yeah, and you yelled from the stands. And did the referee ever change it because you yelled from the stands? No. But occasionally, if a player falls down, the referee will change the play. Tom Brady. But, um, <laughs> or sometimes, <laughs> or sometimes, if the coach throws a flag, they'll review. But they'll never change the play for a spectator. Here's why. Life is not a spectator sport. It is a participator sport. You can't win it if you're not in it. You can change the dialogue. You can influence the conversation. You can implement the strategy, but you can never do it from the periphery. You have to roll up your sleeves and say, I'm all in. Until you do that, it's, it's a cool idea. It's a cool concept. But tell me, let me, let me encourage you with these words. Nothing of significance in this world has ever happened with people on the periphery. Game changing. Everybody got involved. Two, two last analogies, and then I'll wind up. Two things I would encourage you to do. Change your vocabulary. Georgetown Medical University did a study, and they said in 100% of the cases when your vocabulary increased, your IQ goes up. So make sure every day you're putting into your mind the good, the clean, the pure, the powerful, and the positive. But change your vocabulary every day to include information that is alien to you. And second, study cultures for what they represent. The heroes that liberated them, the currencies that shaped them, the primary exports, the principal imports. There are many different people groups in this world. And almost every one of them has a story. We will never have true impact in the diversity realm, whether it's in gender or whether it's in whatever category that we are looking at, whatever bias we're trying to overcome, until we understand people for who they are and what they represent. Well-meaning people will walk up to me and say, well, you're from India. Do you know my doctor? No, he doesn't know me either. <laughs> or uh, I love spicy food. Eat a jalapeno. What they're saying is, I don't know what to say, so I'm going to trample on eggshells. As long as we make our conversation legal, we will just participate in what is called frivolous conversation, less banter. But till we make it emotional, vested in the fact that we understand who they are, where they came from, what raised them, what generated them, what gives them hopes, what gives them dreams, we will have not expanded our horizon to begin to realize that in the beauty of God's grace and in the timeless wisdom of his creation, this world is vast and wide. But as F.W. Borum said, it's okay for man to believe that the world is wide and a nice place. But to do that he must be forever and ever sampling infinity. He must buy the books he would do anything to shun and shun the books he so dearly wants to buy. We have to change our worldviews. We have to change our opinions. But along the way, have a thick hide, folks. It's OK. I remember I was standing in West Palm Beach, Florida, waiting for the shuttle. Now, when I stand outside an airport hotel waiting for a shuttle, I usually don't wear a suit. I change into my traveling togs. So I was wearing jeans and a t-shirt. I'd just done a seminar for a Fortune 30 company. I was flying higher than a kite. And as I'm watching, the driver of the shuttle is running late. So I pick up my bags and go and put them in the back of the shuttle. Baggage handling is easy. You just lift. Well, the lady standing next to me, 
looked at this. She looked like she'd fallen asleep in a salad bar. She had the hat with the whole fruit number working. <laughs> she used her nose, which doubled as a pointer, and asked me to put her bags in the van. I just picked them up, put them in the van. The dude standing next to her now wants to get involved in this little immigrant episode. <laughs> so he grunts for me to put his bags in the van, which I did. Now, I just got done bragging on this country. I called it the last bastion of freedom and opportunity, the only Eden this side of heaven. Most of you know what I did next. I went for the tip. <laughs> <laughs> I put my hand in front of the guy. He gave me a buck and change. I put my hand in front of the gal. She gave me a buck and change. They were ignorant. I made $3. What a country. <laughs> when we got in the van, I flipped my luggage tag over where I have my official title, Intergalactic Yoda. <laughs> the guy didn't know me. He knew my boss's name, Zig Ziglar, at that time. He said, oh, my God, I've made a horrible mistake. <laughs> I said, you're not getting your money back. <laughs> at which point he said the words that make the story told and retold. He said, friend, I wish all my employees had your disposition. Ultimately, that's what diversity is, folks, disposition. Laws will be passed. Regulations will be given. Structures will be altered. Societies will adhere. But the individual center of it, trying to create a ripple, has to have the right disposition. We all know how to do things until you know why you need to do it. See, why is formulaic. When you know why, anyhow will do. That day I could have reacted. When the ladies looked at me with the hat, I could have said, ma'am, I don't know which room you had in the hotel. Mine had a mirror. <laughs> Before you decide to come out as a specimen like Carmen Sandiego, you should check with people. <laughs> I could have looked at that guy and I said, knucklehead, you want two of these? They'd still be ignorant and I'd get mad. See, when you have the right disposition, life changes. One day I spoke for a group like this, August and Regal. I was actually wearing a tuxedo that day, and we went out to get the car. My bride was, she says, where's the car? I said, I gave it to the valet, so I gave her the check, and she went to get the check to the valet. Now I'm standing there in a tuxedo at the foyer of the hotel, and a dude stands next to me and says, I need a cab. <laughs> I don't know what you know about big hotels. You raise your hand, one will come. So I raised my hand, one came. I had my, he put the money, put the... Mm. <laughs> Another guy walks up and he says, I need one too. Sure. <laughs> Anila walks up in a little sequin gown. She looks amazing. I look like a maitre d'. She says, what are you doing? I said, if you're quiet, I think I can pay for dinner. <laughs> there is a quote that's attributed to me. Plan with attitude, will. Prepare with aptitude, skill. Participate with servitude, humility. Receive with gratitude, honor. And that should to separate you from the multitudes. Plan with attitude, prepare with aptitude. Participate with servitude, receive with gratitude. And that should be enough to separate you from the multitudes. And folks, I'll close like I always do by saying I've literally traveled the world and the seven seas. I've been on my highs and many a night I wept on my knees. But of all the groups I've spoken to, the most humbled, privileged, and honored I am is to have spoken for you. I'm Nick's dad saying, I hope you have a fantastic conference. God bless you. Wow. Now, if that don't get you riled up, there's a dead cat on the line somewhere. Chris, we just want to say thank you for coming and leaving a residue in each one of us. And what you have done today is going to take us to the next level. It's going to change some folks' minds in here, their way of thinking.
that we are doing and make a new commitment to what we're all about here at this diversity thing. So let's just continue to go from one level to the next level to the next level. And this is the guy that's going to lead us right here. Come on up, Andre. Okay, are uh, you ready to rumble? I'm telling you. Yep, yep. So uh, I tell you, when I saw this young man a few months ago, I said, this is the one that's going to start the conference right here. And I think all of you will agree that you are ready to go. When I said suit up, suit up, okay? And so I just uh, I so appreciate what you would do, have done to add value and the contribution you have made to those who do noble work each and every day. And I believe we are so up on the right path in pursuit of greatness through diversity. And we just wish you well as you continue out there to make a difference around the country, around the world. And let your father know, job well done in Reno, Nevada. So, I mean, I'm telling you, this is the man right here. This is the man right here. So I have a few brief announcements before we go to our next sessions. A couple of announcements. Please, please, please listen closely. There will be a brief meeting for all human resource advisors. This will be an opportunity with the new Air National Guard Chief of Diversity, Lieutenant Colonel Melinda Sutton. The meeting will be just prior to the 1830 icebreaker in Paradise A. There, if you have not had the chance to spend time with Sergeant Ken, where is he at? Where is Sergeant Ken at? You, you got to do better than that. <laughs> You got to give me one more. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and for those who have not had a chance to meet this young man, tomorrow there will be a PT session starting at 0500 in the east parking lot. You will hate yourself for not accessing, spending time, and being with this individual here. So we're asking all of you at 0500 in the east parking lot, be with the man last year. He's been outstanding every year. I'm just wondering, you give me one of those again. <laughs> Please go, because he, he's, he's hungry. All right, so all seams will meet between 1,200 and 1,300 today and tomorrow in Treasurer's Sea, which is right across the hall here. All Air National Guard EO professionals and Army National Guard EOAs will meet this evening. 1700 to 1800 in Paradise D. Okay, and also uh, all the uh, there will be a tag LCP course held in Grand Ballroom A. Just just for the tags who signed up for the L LCP or their representatives, it will be in Ballroom Grand Ballroom A. Everyone, when I dismiss you, you will have to clear out of this room. We will start back up at 10:30. One final announcement: you must report to your assigned breakout rooms. I know you have friends, those you haven't seen in a while. We need you to go to your assigned rooms. Everybody got that? You must go to your assigned breakout rooms. Your conference badges are color-coded to make it easy for the room monitors to check. Yes, you will be checked, so don't try to sneak in. Okay, I understand that some of you prefer to be with your friends and unit members, but it's important to go where you have been assigned. Otherwise, we will have be, will be chaos. Also, we have the SPs here. If we got to use them, we have a big jail on Park Boulevard in Reno. So, so we need everybody to go to their assigned rooms. We will start back up promptly at 1030. Please, everyone clear out of here. Start up at 1030. Thank you very much. <laughs>